show you if you're all right, Pastor. Yeah, you're looking all right. Yeah, let's have a smile now. Thank you. <laughs> I was, um, last night was kind of haircut time. And uh, I had mine done very late last night. Uh, but it reminded me of something I had written down in the office the other day. Uh, and it said, men who are bored at the front of their heads are good thinkers. Yeah. Men who are bored at the back of their heads are good lovers. Men who are bored at the front and the back think they're good lovers. Uh, well, um, I've been thinking a lot in the last few days about this passage and um, every time I thought about it, something new came and then I kind of rethought it. Really try to serve what the Lord was trying to say this morning to us who are here today. And uh, we'll see how the Lord leads on this one. I wonder if you've uh, thought, I'm sure you have, at times, uh, look, I'm just kind of sick and tired of this. I just want this moment, this stuff that's going on now, to be over and to move on. I want you to get on with the rest of my life. I don't want all this stuff that's happening right now. And we often think like that. I wonder, does that ever actually speed things up? Does it make us feel any better by thinking those things? When it comes with our, to our walk with the Lord, one of the most difficult things for us is to... Um, See that God kind of is perhaps pushing into some, some direction, wanting us to do something. And we're not quite sure when. Uh, I remember, some of you will know this story, I remember when Ali and I got married and we both kind of felt that the Lord was calling us to some full-time service. Uh, I'd been in youth work for seven years, so it kind of felt like it was perhaps youth work. And slowly over time, and it was over time, uh, it became apparent that it was in kind of partial church leadership. And so I went to the local, in the Baptist denomination, we have a system, good system. I went to the local ministerial recognition committee and uh, we talked about my call and they said, not yet. And there was a lot of stuff going on in my life at the time and I really was felt convinced. This was the moment. You know, this was when God wants me to go. This is when God wants me to get on with this stuff that he wants me to get on. And they said, not yet there. So I, we um, found a little church local to us and we ministered there as lay pastor for a year while we tried to worked this through and I did some studying and so on and went back to the men recognizing and they said, okay, you can move forward. Now we recognize that this is the time. Exciting. So we, um, I went off to Spurgeon's College, which was the local college in like London where we were in Essex and uh, went there for two days. real and tested and so on and then I remember sitting before a lot more people than this in a room and they were firing questions at me and at the end I sat and waited outside and uh, J.J. Brown got on and I'm going to J.J. Brown and um, Lord you know, and he came out and said that we really don't feel that this is right for you to come to spirit. Actually it was kind of relief because I was sitting there and I kind of felt this is not the right place for me either. But none of us kind of were able to give any answers to what was next. So we then went away and we felt disappointed and waited. Uh, long story short, because it is quite a long story, uh, I ended up going with Ali around the whole country to all the Baptist colleges in the country. Finally walked into Bristol Baptist College 
And almost on walking in the door of meeting the principal, I felt, this is the place. So he went to Bristol, and um, after three years of training, a lot of those who were in my year were coming out and had a fine church to go to. We were almost the last one to get sent into it. Now we did it all the same. It's going to keep testing, it's going to keep pushing along. You've got to wait, you've got to be patient. Uh, so when we came to this passage this morning, I was thinking about patience and God can't be rushed. So I was also thinking about uh, the story, going just briefly, because most of you know the story of Abraham and Sarah, or Abraham and Sarah, the was the point. Get 75 years old. No children, and yet God had promised them that he would be the father of a great nation. Strange, doesn't it? Get all that through that age and have to be Lord, are you sure? You'd be convinced of this. And at the age of 75, God says, okay, you're going to have a son. Now, how many of you would think if you were 75 and God said you're going to have a son, if you're convinced that was what the Lord wanted you to do, it would kind of happen like now? No. There was then another 25 odd years of waiting before the child was born. Because in the meantime, they got a little impatient with God. And uh, in trying to kind of rush the process, you know, they went down the wrong route for a while. God knows the plan. You can't doubt him. You can't say you're getting it wrong, you're doing it the wrong timing, you know, you're sure God. Sometimes, well, maybe often, we have to wait for the Lord to fulfill his plan in and through us. That's not to say that we just sit back and wait for it to happen. Because in the process, God wants us to go through all sorts of things in life in preparation for what he perhaps called us to, as in Abraham and Sarah. Um, and for many years, I believed I it was where God wanted us. And um, the things, something special was going to happen and uh, you know, if I was the average Baptist minister, I would have moved on to two churches by now in the league years. Because they didn't stay around by four in um, But I believe this is where the Lord wants us. And uh, this is where we stay. And I sense that something of that specialness that God has called us to here, I thought, is beginning to happen. And uh, there is a lot more to come. And having been around my for 15 years, coming in various ways, I'm not going to run off and do stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who knows, if we'd have been somewhere else, and he would not be now preaching somewhere. Um, so, we're reading about David. That's not an introduction. It's not going to be a long talk. Uh, we're reading about David. Remember David, we started off, little shepherd boy, little shepherd guy. Uh, Samuel calls him and declares him and anoints him that he is going to be the king of Israel. Wow. And then you remember a little bit later on the story, little Dave goes out and takes supplies to his brothers who are in the army, supposedly fighting the Philistines. And little David goes out and he knows the story. Goliath. And then he gets to play some soothing music to the king. Little David, who's been told some years back that he would become king, is now sitting in the palace playing to the king himself. And then he goes out and starts fighting some battles and winning and everyone's cheering and shouting and, and lifting up David and saying how great he is and Saul starts to get jealous. And you kind of think, when are we going to get to the king then? You know, David was told he's going to be king. And he goes through all of these things 
and he's still not king, in fact he's just playing a harp to the king. In fact, the king is now chasing after him to get rid of him, he's so jealous. He's trying to kill David. Do you think, is this really in your plan, Lord? I thought I was anointed when I was younger to be king. I mean, I'm going to be killed by the king. But it's God's plan. It's God's plan. And Saul is making a mess of being king. So you kind of think, if Saul is making a mess of being king, is it about time that Saul was kind of ousted and David is put on the throne? Word kept coming to me in the way. And today we move on to this little story about David. Just to let you know, the end of the story is still not king. That's a bit of a spoiler, isn't it? But you know, read the story still and get the king. So David is out on the run. And, and Saul decides to pursue David. He wants to get hold of David. And he hears that David's down by the En Gedi desert. And so he takes with him a few guys. Well, 3,000 strong, healthy, fit guys, actually. Is that a bit overkill? You can see how desperate Saul was to catch up with David. You think, that would be a good reason for God now to step in. This is the moment. I mean, this is what David's little group of followers, uh, his little band of soldiers, kind of were saying. Look, there's Saul. He's coming in to go to the back. He's coming in to go to the loo. What a moment. Hey, you can go in and you can kill him and you're promised to be king and you can sit on the throne and everything will be great. This is what God wants to do. kind of wants to prove something so he goes up to Saul while he's leaving himself and just gets a knife he gets a knife and he cuts off a little corner of the king's robe which he feels terrible about he says in the passage and he would cut the king's robe but it was kind of a way of proving something so he cuts the king's robe and David kind of says you know I could have killed you Look, could have killed you. I could have easily cut off your head, but instead of cutting off your head, I cut a little bit of rope to prove that I was there and I was able. Why are you chasing me, says David? I'm not your enemy. <coughs> well, at that point, King Saul seemed to be glad to be alive. He said to David, David, you're, you're a much better man than I am. I know that one day you're going to be king. That's the problem. So I know one day you're going to be king. And may the Lord reward you well for the way that you treated me. You kind of think this is where the violence start playing and things start to get better. Because Saul gives orders for his 3,000 fit guys to go back home. And if you were David on that day, you might have shouted, Woohoo! Finally, it's over. I can get on with my life, and one day I'll be on the throne, and everything will be alright, and it's all in God's hands. But you know, when someone has a real jealousy inside them, it's never really over unless they repent of that to God. And so Saul had not really changed his attitude. He was just thankful he was still alive. And David, the one day king, was still living in the hills and the desert. And David could not build a permanent house 
because he still feared that Saul would be after him. He knew that it wasn't over. He knew that it wasn't over until he one day sat on the throne himself. Because David was about as far from the palace as you can get at this point. As far as David was concerned, whatever God's plans was, it was taking way too long. And it didn't seem to be working. I'm getting further and further away from the palace. I'm running away from the king. You sure, Lord, you got this right? You know, so often when we have a goal in life, we want to reach it as quick as possible, don't we? Particularly in the 21st century, you know, the instant. But, get it done now. And we often think, in our humanness, that when we go through some pain, whatever that pain is for us, it means that we need to change our goal, we need to change our direction. We've kind of lost our way, so we must be going in a different direction and in order to get out of this painful moment. But sometimes, in fact, quite often, a willingness to accept that pain, whatever it is, that struggle, that hardship, that perhaps war that we seem to be coming up against, demonstrate that the happiness is the God. We visualise something and think, I, I've got to have this now. The Lord's calling me to this. It must be now. But that's not the way God works. Look for the Bible time and time again, not just David and Abraham. <coughs> Do you recall the Lord's Prayer? And that little line there, give us this day our God. And so often, if we're honest, we would love the Lord to give us today's bread and tomorrow's bread and bread for the next 30 years that we cover. And yet, God has bread, if you like, for us today. And tomorrow he's going to give us some different bread. Maybe a different flavour of bread. Different type of bread. <coughs> Our problem is that we cannot see where the bread is coming from tomorrow, and so we're kind of... Instead of just saying, okay, Lord, well, I'll just keep walking, you supply as I go forward. Remember the man from heaven in the desert in order. Our problem is that we can't always see it, and so in our human mess we kind of think perhaps we're doing it wrong, perhaps we ought to stop, perhaps we ought to go back, perhaps we ought to change the direction, perhaps we ought to say something different, and go away from the actual calling that God has called us to. David must have been very tempted to take matters into his own hands at that point. There was Saul alone in the cave. <coughs> and his men were prompting him. Carry him! Carry him! This is it! You're never going to get this opportunity again. He knew that one day he would be king. Just had to wait. Just had to go through testing. Wonder how many of us believe that God is calling us to some kind of ministry, and you know what I mean by ministry. I don't mean you know standing up, healing, preaching, or whatever it's other things. Whatever your ministry is, and you go, oh, I, know. I really feel that this is where God wants me to be and do this, but I don't seem to be getting there yet. So many ministries, if you will, so many Christians think that they're, they'd be doing something for God and, and they kind of fail because they give up. They kind of think this is not happening. They don't take into account that God's timing is not our timing. And we have to wait. God 
can't be right. David chose to believe that if God had anointed him as king, then God was able to make him king at some point. And he would have to go through all these things, and after all, all these things actually gave him the experience and the strength and the stamina and, and all of that to be king and the greatest king that Israel's ever known. God has anointed each and every one of us to be a child of his and to function in some way. To carry out some good. It doesn't matter who you are, what age you are, what experience you have in the background, there's still something God wants you to do in the future. And we're all going to go through the kind of trials and get to it. Your trials are going to be my trials. Remember Peter wrote in the New Testament, Dear friends, he said in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange happened to you. He was saying to the church, you're going to go through bad experiences. Don't get off course, just don't be surprised by it though because if God's calling you to something, he's going to take you through and test you and check you out and make sure you get strength and so on to get through it. Patience. Step at a time. But keep taking that step. And use the time to prepare to say, don't sit back at home and say, okay, God, when you're ready. God's timing is important. And the enemy always tries to push us in the wrong direction or to force us into something that is not right. Remember he tempted Jesus right at the beginning of his ministry. And before Jesus went out and did anything, he was out in the desert and the devil came to him and tempted him with pretty much what I've just been talking about. You remember the devil came up to Jesus and he said, you know, if you worship me, you can have all this. Your, your name will be honoured. Everyone will worship you. You know, you'll be great. You wanted to go through any struggles. That was the temptation for the amount of the devil was laying on Jesus' feet in the desert before he started his ministry, before he got on with the good stuff for those three years, before he went to the cross for you and me. And Jesus said, My mind is made up to worship God and God alone. <coughs> now get out of here, Satan. I've got a task to do and I've got to get through this. I've got to walk the walk that God's called me. <coughs> and Jesus received all that Satan had promised and more. But he did it in God's way and in God's timing. God's way is always going to be the best way. And whatever our problems may be today, Let's make up our minds to let the Lord bring about the solution to get us through to where he wants us to be. Amen? <coughs> We're going to do one song. It's the actual song that's on the video. Any clues as to what it might be? I'm talking about all this. Struggles, getting through God's way. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Uh, we've got the video, the, the words are up on the video, so it was uh, easy to do it this way, and it's quite nice back in track to listen to it. Let's stand and sing this.